The little town that uh, we live in is called Franklin, Tennessee. And uh, you know what I love is it's not a, it's, it's not a big center of town. Uh, but you can just walk down the street and go into places and you can just pray for people. And I was in uh, with some other friends and they had not been in my friend's mattress store, Greg Redman. Many of you know Greg Redman. He moved there. He started this wave by obeying the Lord and going. And so he went to this place called Franklin, Tennessee on a word from the Lord. And he opened this organic bedding store. He's never been in the organic bedding business that I know of. But he turned it into a place of worship. And there were worship leaders there Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday. And you'd go in the store and you would just be drawn in there. And I would have, I have on my phone today 27 pictures of random people that I know that went to Tennessee to visit Franklin and ended up in Greg's store. They were tourists. They were not looking for mattresses. But it's the Spirit of God that drew them into the mattress store, having no idea why they were what they were doing there, they just stood there. And then Greg would walk over and read their mail, prophesy over them. And then, he w- then they would say, well, what is this place? He would say, well, it's really an undercover worship prayer center, <laughs> but I sell mattresses. <laughs> you know, this is what we're doing today. Ordinary people doing extraordinary things. And our school, I did not want to start a school. And then COVID happened. And the Lord said, you have a little time. I go, yeah, but i really interested in that. We started this school for one, one thing, <clears throat> to equip people to do the works of the ministry that God has prepared for you to do in advance, period. And there are tons of schools out there. We didn't try to compete with schools, but one thing I see that the body of Christ desperately needs in this hour, and that is powerful teams who run as a kingdom family. We don't have that kind of training in our schools online. There just isn't an example of that. Everybody is equipped for themselves, which is important, yes. But in this day for multi-generational revival to happen in the state of California, we need people to learn how to equip teams in humility, but with power and authority in Jesus' name. And there is a certain skill set that is required. It's pragmatic, as, as Brandon said. But it's also supernatural. We need leaders who are looking at the next generations with high regard, not disdain. We need leaders who look at this next generation as the gold mine, the great harvesters, not the, oh, God, what's going to happen to the church? Look, everybody, this is a shift. A big shift is happening. Everybody on deck, get your life preserver on or whatever. For those of you who've been on a cruise, like, it's go time. Turn to your neighbor and say, let's go. It's time. For any of you from the Rock of Roseville interested in doing our school, if you just mention that when you fill out an app and you say, I'm from the Rock, even if you're not from the Rock, but you're here right now, we will give you $100 off. We want people to be equipped. We're not about making money, you guys. We have a lot of overhead costs with our administrators and people around the world. We are trying to equip the body of Christ. All right, so that being said, uh, I I do want to mention something. I'm really sad to tell you that there are only two copies left out in the lobby, but oh well. I I wrote a new book, and uh, I'm just very grateful to God. Uh, Nobody wants to write a book. Everyone wants to say they wrote a book. That's what I said yesterday. And that's because writing a book's like birthing a baby. You think, is it over yet? And then they tell you, oh no, you've just begun. You're like, are you kidding me right now? How long is this gonna take? This book, I wrote it because I wanted every person who believes in Jesus and people that don't believe in Jesus to understand that his authority and his power exists today. Signs, wonders, and miracles exist today. I wrote this because I wanted every person that gets a hold of this to see at the end of every chapter that you can pray and by the word of God and the power of the spirit, his words never return void and you can be healed and set free and you can be the sent one, which is what Jesus said we should be. This book then tells you in every chapter, give it away. 
Matthew 10, 7 and 8, the spirit of generosity is the gospel of Jesus Christ. Give it away. Everything you know about Jesus, you give it away with a generous heart full of love and compassion for the least of these. So there are only two copies, but there's a code and you can get it. If you already roll in the power of Jesus and you're like, man, I'm already there. Really? Well, there's more because <laughs> God is an abundant God. Buy it for somebody that you know doesn't roll in it. It's funny. It's got some, I mean, this is not about me. This is about our Agape Freedom Fighters team. They don't even know, half of them don't even know they're in the book. They haven't even read it yet. I just wrote about them. I, I said their names, everything. I didn't get their permission. <laughs> I'm like the worst author on the planet. My publisher's like, did you get these people's permission? I go, mm, they don't care. I sent it to my buddy Blaine Cook, who was co-leader in the vineyard movement with John Wimber back in the day. I sent it to him last week, and I go, oh, by the way, you're in chapters blob and blob and blob. I never asked him. I'm like, I can't wait till he opens it and goes, nice. <laughs> yeah, will you give this to somebody? Okay. And uh, whoever is a massive journaler, is there a massive journaler in here? Somebody really likes to write? Amy, would you go give this to somebody? Somebody, keep your hands up. Amy will come give this to you. Thanks, sweetie. Okay, uh, Lord, I just pray right now by the power. <laughs> Did she yell out, Amy? That's the way to get gifts. Pick me. Lord, I just thank you for this morning. I thank you for our partnership with the Rock of Roseville. I thank you that this is a grounded house. Lord, I thank you, Father that it's time for wells to spring up. God, I thank you that this has always been a house where anyone can come just as they are. I'm thankful, Father, for the humility of the leaders here, and I'm, I'm thankful for every person who calls this place home and every visitor and everybody online. I'm grateful, Father, that, that there's a hunger rising up, and I speak that out over you who have gone dormant in the spirit, and I say that this is a passionate pursuit of God time. Father, thank you because your spirit draws us into you for our first love encounter. For by the power of the testimony and the blood of the lamb, we overcome the enemy. So Father, thank you that we have testimonies yet to live and we have testimonies we've lived that we need to start telling of all you have done for us and all you desire to do through us. We ask you, come Holy Spirit and take over this time we have together this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. Are you excited? Yes. Me too. Okay. I talk really fast. So just go like this. Whoa. I had coffee this morning. I had a lot of it. So I'm trying to, and my mind's going like. I practiced that SpongeBob thing when my son was little. So I'm really good at it now. So anytime I can use it as a noise on stage, I do. <laughs> All right. Listen, Rocker Roosevelt. I was praying uh, on the 21st for you guys. And I heard the word very loud in the spirit restoration. I've spoken some of this to uh, Pastor Brandon, but I, I felt like this, the promises from the beginning, the promises from the beginning of the Rock of Roseville, even before it was called Rock of Roseville, there was a church. And, and even from the beginning, those promises are going to come into a place of restoration in this season. And I saw the Lord particularly put his hand on marriages, families, unity of generations, university, um, the unity of any kind of division of gender and division of races and division of economic groups. I just saw this great time of restoration. And I'm, then, I, then I heard the Lord say, I'm going to restore finances. I'm going to restore finances. This is not a place of drought. And in the name of Jesus, we break off every word curse that's been spoken over downtown Roseville. So many people drive through here and go, oh, the people, the homeless, the this, the that. No, this is a place where glory dwells. 
downtown Roseville. So Lord, I thank you that you said about the rock of Roseville, you're restoring finances, but you're restoring relationships of every type. And then the Lord said to me, Isaiah chapter two. And I said, what do you want to say to them out of that? And he said, walk in the light. Choose today who you're going to serve. Walk in the light. And then I was reading that over and over again. And I, I just love the word of God, you know. And then he led me all over the place. But I'll, I will just say this last thing. I was led to a quote by Charles Spurgeon. How many love Charles Spurgeon? Man, I wish he was alive today. I would pick his brain all day long. He said this. So this is talking about Isaiah 2 and walking in the light. He said, if you were going to Australia on a good sound ship, you would get there even if you had to hold on to the luggage racks lying down among the rats. Just don't like that picture at all. But how much better to sail there in a first class cabin? This is the difference between dwelling in your troubles or walking in the light. Where you give your agreement to, that place has power over you. You give your agreement to your troubles, there's not gonna be many mirthquakes happening. <laughs> That's the best word yet. You know, I know in this world we're gonna have trials. Listen, I live them. And when God was amazing to me and healed me, I had gone through that 15 years of desert experience. And every day I had to choose. I'm not saying that I had the best days. I had to choose if I was going to take all my pills that I had or get up and face another day. And some of you have been waiting 15 years for some type of breakthrough of, of something. We've got to stop focusing on the issue, the problem, and magnifying that because what you magnify gets bigger. Magnify the Lord. He is so present, so present in your life and in your children and your grandchildren and your wayward parents or your wayward aunts or your neighbors that drive you crazy or your business partner that you can't stand. Pray without ceasing with thanksgiving and watch God move. Come on. Worship the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding in all your ways. What church? Acknowledge him and he will make your paths what? Straight. Worship the Lord. Worship the Lord. You know, when you're in the morning, you're like, okay, I got up. I'm having my quiet time. And you still feel Ugh, when you finish. You probably should have gotten up 15 minutes earlier and got on your face and worship the Lord. Because one thing I know about my father in heaven, he comes when his children call. But when you have a spirit of distraction, oh, then you'll get up and leave. In his presence, we prayed this upstairs, is the fullness of joy. In his presence. There's a earthquake in his presence. Every day. Every day. I think that we would have to be completely stone deaf and blind to not feel and sense a holy tension happening on this planet right now. Anybody? This is a time where we're coming, I believe prophetically, we're coming out of a transition and into a new season. There's a time right now on the earth, I believe that we have entered into, you're not gonna like this, but receive it. We're entering into a whole new season of dependency. Look, I'm the first one who loves to do what we just did because it was super fun. But the Lord is doing a new thing, which is this very verse that Brandon quoted that the Lord's given me for this season. Behold, I am doing a new thing. Can you not perceive it? There will be shaking. But who are you holding on to for your foundation? 
Everything you need for a life of godliness and overcoming is in the word of God. And as you read the word of God and pray it over yourself and over your situations, the Holy Spirit's invited in and things change. I was in South Carolina uh, a bit ago, and I uh, never been to the Carolinas to, to do anything in ministry. And I, I want to tell you the story about a young couple. This couple, to me, uh, they're, they're paramount for what God's doing in this day. In the time that they were encountered by the Holy Spirit, their church was not moving in signs and wonders and miracles. And they were ostracized by their large church. Very, very, very big church. Very prominent, five campuses. And they were those people. She was on staff and she was like, you've gone to the dark side. So they were removed from their church by request. And instead of becoming bitter, they said, well, we've encountered God. We believe God wants to encounter his people in this area. I'm, I'm talking to all of us here. We can't come into circle the wagons and get around the campfire and not let anybody in. <laughs> So much more fun, though, isn't it? Not to have people looking at you like, oh, it's that church. The Holy Rollers. That's a good way of saying it. This couple began to pray for their region. And as they prayed for their region in South Carolina, they began to see breakthrough. But let me tell you, it's been a long time coming. It's been 10 years they've been praying for breakthrough in this region. And I was visiting there, and I was in the hotel, and I had to do a conference, and here was what was so funny to me. The very church that kicked them out invited them back to host their conference at that church. Yes and amen, Jesus. I didn't know that. I woke up that morning to, to head in there, and I heard at about four in the morning, it's happening in the Piedmont. I heard the Holy Spirit say that. I was like, I don't even know what that is. Happening in the Piedmont. What an interesting thing, God. And then, this is how bad it is when I'm traveling. If I'm traveling back to back to back, I really don't look at where I'm, my husband's so cute. He goes, honey, do you know where you're going? I go, mm, mm I just show up. People pick me up and then I go. I didn't know that I was actually in a region called the Piedmont. I had no idea. It's happening in the Piedmont. And I said that in the church service. And the Holy Spirit came in the room. And I went up to the worship leader who was on the platform, who I don't know, never been there, and I whisper in her ear, all authority has been given to you to break through addictions in this region. And as you speak it right now, in the name of Jesus, family lines are going to be set free. And she fell over on her keyboard. I had no idea she had been delivered off the streets from methamphetamine addiction. And she was the first of her family. God, I had Holy Spirit all down my back. Ooh. The first of her family line... The first to be free. Many of you are the first to be free. You have authority in these realms to speak what is true in the spirit. Does the word of God say what is already bound in heaven, you can bind here. What is loosed in heaven, you can loose here. This is the power of the supernatural God inside of you. Amen. Second Chronicles, turn in your Bible to chapter 20, verse 6. It is hot in here now. Come on. Man, why I wore a jacket? What did I think it was going to snow? I'm not sure. Okay. Oh, <laughs> Ooh, Holy Spirit, come on. Ooh. Oh, Lord. Ooh, Second Chronicles 20, verse 6. Oh, Lord, the God of our fathers, are you not God in the heavens? And are you not ruler over all the kingdoms of the nations? Power and might are in your hands so that no one can stand against you. Nobody. No politician in the state of California. No judicial system in the state of California can stand against God Almighty. And if my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face. I will turn and heal their land. Worship and prayer. Worship and prayer. 
The promises in Micah 5.4 are still true today through the power of Jesus Christ. And he will arise the shep and shepherd his flock in the strength of the Lord, in the majesty of the name of the Lord his God. And they will remain. Say, we will remain. We will remain. Because at that time, he will be great to the end of the earth. Church. Maybe you're not going to go to the end of the earth, but can you go to the end of your neighborhood? Can you go to the end of the cubicle where you work? Can you go to the break room? Can you just release kindness? Kindness is a breaker. It's so foreign these days. Job 42.2 says this. I know that you can do all things and that no purpose of yours can be thwarted. I could go on and on about promises in scripture, but I want you to know, remember Gamaliel? Do you remember that guy in the Bible? Gamaliel was running this school, this Hebrew school. It was the great scholar Gamaliel and all the Pharisees are coming at Jesus and they're like, take him down, take him down. And Gamaliel's the one voice from factual evidence. Don't you need some factual evidence today, everybody? The voice of fear is rampant. Let's get some factual evidence and let's speak truth. And Gamaliel goes, well, you guys, history shows if this is of God, you can't stop it. So have fun with that. But if it's not of God, it will deteriorate. Church, there's a move of God about to happen in this nation. And there's a move of darkness that's on the rise. But how did you think the bright light of Jesus was going to shine in a world that wasn't completely dark? That was my morning wake up about three months ago. I said, no, no, I don't like this encroaching darkness at all. I'll be gaming it down on the speaker. I'm a joy person. He goes, well, how do you think I'm going to shine brightly if it's half lit over here? Jesus said, hot or cold? Hot or cold, baby? It's time for us to go, okay, I'm, I'm ready. Whatever you want to do, God, I'm ready. But this is a new season, everybody. You keep trying to hold on to what you had. I'm telling you right now. It's, it, it is so a reverent fear of the Lord right now. I just want him. And the church needs him. We all need him. I want to, you to see something with me. The word of God is so rich with metaphors, symbolisms, and true stories of human endeavors that went awry and then God, but God came in. I want you to turn to 2 Kings in chapter 3 and just have that open in case the Lord gives you a revelation and you write it down so when you're having a hard day, you go back and go, oh yeah. Do you ever open your Bible and go, oh yeah. I write all over everything because they are markers of the Lord's wisdom. And boy, do we need it. Wisdom and revelation. So I want to paraphrase for time this morning, but this is about being in the right place at the right time. Some of you feel a lot of restlessness right now. That's what happens in transition. And it's so uncomfortable. But remember this, my friends. Jesus lived in transition. He lived for three years in transition. How uncomfortable. He knew his father. But the timing is always the father. He was so dependent on the father for every breath. And he had to put up with people. Often, God will use people around you like a little bit of sandpaper. 
Got a couple of those in your life? Yeah, some of you are like, yeah, they're right next to me. Mm. <laughs> being, being in the right place at the right time is vital. It's not only vital to your personal destiny, but vital to the fulfillment of the will of God on this planet right now. I want to dive into 2 Kings because there's something extraordinary there that, that the Lord showed me about 10 days ago. And I, I love that, you know, it's the matter, it, it, it's for us kings to search out what God is trying to say. Not every revelation has already been written. There's a bunch of revelation in the Bible just for you. All right, I'm just going to leave that there. All right, in this chapter of scripture, there are three kings ruling at this time. Jehoram is Ahab's son. Say Ahab's son. Okay, he's king of Israel ruling from Samaria. Say Samaria. All right, here's who this guy is. In case you don't know, he's wicked, but he's not as wicked as his highly dysfunctional parents. Ahab and Jezebel. Right, we love to say that name. We can't stand Jezebel. Ahab was no picnic. They were both dysfunctional. All right, he put away the statue of Baal, the idol of Baal, but he never devoted himself to Yahweh. Well, there are a lot of people who live as Christians today, and they might not have er earthly idols around them, but they sure didn't devote themselves to God either. Hot or cold? Hot or cold. All right. The second guy, the second king in this area is Misha. This is the king of Moab living and ruling on the eastern side of the Dead Sea. Say the Dead Sea. Okay, this guy was a sheep breeder, and he regularly paid Jehoram, the king of Israel, a ton of money through 100,000 lambs and the wool of 100,000 rams. This was a type of taxation to Israel with Ahab's death, okay? Heavy tax to be the king of Moab. Feels like California, okay? All right, stay with me. So Misha wanted out of the payment plan. I'm not gonna say what I'm thinking right now. Anyone who got a tax refund is like, yes, right? This king, Mesha, he revolted against Jehoram, the king of Israel. He's like, done, not paying you anymore. So here, here we go to the third king in the story is Jehoshaphat. Everybody say Jehoshaphat, just because that's fun to say of his name. It reminds me of a Chinese restaurant. I don't know why, but every... Every time I hear the name, I think of Chinese food. I don't know, I don't know why. It's very weird. <laughs> but it sticks in my head because of that, because I can even smell Chinese food when I say it. All right. Jehoshaphat is the king of Judah. Say king of Judah. All right. So he's a good guy. Jehoshaphat was a godly king, according to 1 Kings 22, verses 41 through 43. And, and the word of God says that he followed in the godly footsteps of his father, Asa. 1 Kings 15, 9 through 15. Yet his father Asa fought against Israel, right, in that time. And that's also in 1 Kings chapter 15. Jehoshaphat was a peacemaker. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called sons of God. Jehoshaphat was a reconciler. That's what peacemakers are. That's what you are in the new covenant. Reconciling people who are lost to God himself. So Jehoshaphat made peace with the northern kingdom. And Jehoram, whose name I'm tired of saying, I'm just going to call the guy Jerry, okay? All right, so Jerry is fired up when Misha, the king of Moab, decides to stop paying the extortion taxes to Israel. He's like, no go. You got to pay us or you can't stay there. So in 2 Kings, verse 3, verses 6 through 8, he goes to Jehoshaphat and he asks if they can link arms and fight against Moab. Jehoshaphat agrees. So Jerry then asks Jehoshaphat for advice about military strategy to come against Mesha or Moab because Jehoshaphat has way more experience in war than Jerry does. Listen to me, church. 
If we don't align and unite generations, we do not have strategists of war present. If we're looking at the generations under us to carry the weight of the burden of the sin of this world, and we check out at age 60, we have no strategists. We need spiritual parents in this battle that is coming, because it's coming. Jehoshaphat says they will come in from the south. Listen to this. In verses 9 and 10 of this chapter, we see their armies. They've combined armies. They've unified. And now they're marching through the south in the desert of the Edomites where there is no water. Say no water. All right, listen, church. We're going to read verses 9 and 10. So the king of Israel went with the king of Judah and the king of Edom, and they marched on that roundabout route for seven days. And there was no water for the army, nor for the animals that followed them. And the king of Israel said, Alas, for the Lord has called these three kings together to deliver them into the hand of Moab. Man, don't you have to feel for Jehoshaphat right now? Like, this guy's a peacemaker. He leads from the south, and they have no water. For years, Israel and Judah warred, and now he agrees to help Israel and combine his warriors, his soldiers, his strategies from Edom and Israel to take down Moab. And Jerry, Jerry's a piece of work. He is whining and pronounces that God is not with them because they are dying without water after seven days. Jerry, I think, had a bit of a guilty conscience because he knows Jehoshaphat is a godly king and he's a wayward wreck. When you're in sin, you are quick to say, God's not with us. Holy conviction is what was about to happen in this place. Let's see, all right? So let me remind you that this is the time of Elisha. He's the resident prophet in Israel, and he inherited the mantle of Elijah. All right, good? Okay. As a response to the lack of water and the whining Jerry on his right... Jehoshaphat's first response, first response. Remember, this is Old Testament. First response is to ask, is there a prophet of the Lord in this area that we can consult to find out what is going on? Remember, in the Old Testament, the prophets heard from God and delivered the messages to the people. Under the new covenant of grace, we hear the word of the Lord for ourselves. But let's go back to our story. So they are told in verses 11 and 12 that Elisha is there. So Jehoshaphat, Jerry, and the vice regent of Edom, since there was no official king in Edom at that time, they went to see Elisha. (laughs) I love Elisha. He's a black and white prophet if there ever was one. He wants to cut them off and say no. Jerry answers him and tells him, puts his hand, no. All right, he says that they're on official business from the Lord to come against the king of Moab. He basically shuts down the prophet and says, oh no, we're there on official business. You need need to help us. So Elisha answered, what have I got to do with you? That's a Hebrew idiom that means emphatic difference of opinion between the parties and you don't want anything else to do with them. But here's what happens. Elisha stops and he calls for the worshipers. He doesn't speak. He just calls for the worshipers. Now, I want to tell you that they, the word does not say that the worship went on for three days, three hours, three minutes. It doesn't say. It just says that in this scenario, he called for the musicians. For time's sake, let me tell you the rest of the story. Once there was worship and everybody participated in the worship, I cannot imagine how tough this was for the armies who haven't had water. And they're going to worship anyway. Come on, everybody. Seven days, you don't have water? How's that? You know. And we find ourselves at the end of this chapter in this place. Elisha gets a word from the Lord from the worship. From the worship. He gets a word from the Lord. And in this place, he says, there will be a great flood. Ooh, come on. 
There will be a great flood. But here's what you got to do. You got to go and dig trenches because the flood's going to come fast and it's going to come furious. And if you don't dig the trenches, there will be no place for the water. What is he talking about? The spirit of the living God is about to give you victory over Moab. I know you're thirsty. If you do the work, the Lord will provide for you and you won't be thirsty, but it's the bigger picture of God that he's about to win the war for you. Church, come on. There is so much work to be done, but God is not a compulsive God. He's an organized God. There are so many things in metaphor and symbolism with trenches, in wartime, in a trench. It's the provision to hide you from the enemy. It's the place where you can get in and get the sniper attack. The trenches are the places of intimacy with God. Come on, everybody. There will be a flood of the Holy Spirit in this state of California. And if we don't start doing the new thing and let God shake off what we need to have shaken off, we will not be prepared for this flood that's coming. So stand up, church. Who Spirit of God. Digging ditches is hard work. So is digging ditches in the supernatural. Because you got to die to yourself. How many of you love that? Yes. Every day. Every day. I hate it. I hate it so much. Earthquake. Yeah, that's right. I don't know how the Lord's going to touch you, but I know that he wants to. And I'm going to say this to a few of you, and you know who you are. You've been digging trenches and digging trenches and digging trenches for a long time, and you've dug so many trenches that all kinds of people have come to drink out of those trenches. And it's time for those people to dig trenches alongside you and not drink out of yours. This is not a message to have you compulsive people of which I can totally unite myself. This is not a compulsion for you to do more works. It's not what I'm saying. Prep your heart, church. I, I mean, what if you had less time? What if you had less time? What if you really knew there was about to be a great move of God like next week? What would you be doing? I want you to close your eyes. Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit, we love you. And we thank you, God. We thank you, Lord. That there are even trenches in our own hearts that you want to carve out so that your spirit can rest and your word can grow roots. We are the people called by your name so that we may know and believe you and understand that you are he for before you no other God was formed and there will never be another after you. So let your spirit fall, Jesus. Let your spirit fall, God. In every place in your life that occupies your affection and attention in a priority over the Lord, I ask you to consider this hour we're living in. And that you would surrender those things precious and not so precious. That you would surrender those people and those places and positions and earthly things. That you would say, Jesus, whom have I but you? 
The earth has nothing I desire besides you. <laughs> Though my flesh and heart will fail me, because they will. You are the strength of my heart and my portion forever. 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 I surrender these things to you, Lord. And I ask, Holy Spirit, that you help me to dig these trenches. That I would be a holy vessel for your divine purposes. I want you to pray this prayer. Heavenly Father, I surrender. I give you everything. I ask you, Father, to fall on me fresh. Thank you, Jesus, that every good and perfect gift comes down from the Father of lights in whom there is no turning. 